I never thought things would turn out the way they did. You know, you go into marriage with certain expectations, hopes, maybe even dreams. You believe in loyalty and trust and that you both share the same values. At least that's how it was for me. My name is Michael, and I'm the kind of man who believes in stability. Some would call me old-fashioned, but I always thought that tradition and commitment were the foundation of a good marriage. My wife, Lisa, was different from me in some ways more spontaneous, more carefree. She had this bright energy that I loved when we first met, a spark that drew me to her. Back then, I figured that our differences would balance each other out, and for a long time they did. I was the rock, and she was the flame that kept things interesting. But looking back, I can see now that maybe I didn't notice certain things. Or maybe I just didn't want to notice. You think you know someone after all these years, but I guess I was wrong. You'll understand what I mean soon enough. I didn't expect what came next. Life has a way of surprising you when you least expect it, and not always in the best way. What I'm about to tell you well, it changed everything. Lisa and I had been married for over 10 years. A decade is a long time to share your life with someone. And like any marriage, ours had its fair share of ups and downs. We'd been through a lot together, good times, tough times, everything in between. I always believed that the true strength of a relationship is tested over time. And up until recently, I thought we had proven ourselves. 10 years together, after all, says something. I used to think we had figured it out, that we had found our rhythm. In the early years, things were great. We had the usual honeymoon phase where everything felt fresh and exciting. We traveled, explored new places, and built a life together. Even when life settled into a routine, I figured it was normal. You can't expect everything to be thrilling all the time, and that was fine with me. Routine meant stability, and stability is what I valued most. I thought Lisa was on the same page, especially since we'd navigated through so many challenges together. But then, a while back, Lisa started to change. It wasn't sudden, but it was noticeable. She began dropping hints, little comments about how our life had become too predictable, too routine. At first, I didn't take it too seriously. I figured everyone feels that way at some point. After all, life does become repetitive when you've been with someone for as long as we had. But what surprised me was how much it seemed to bother her. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just a passing phase. It wasn't until one evening, after a quiet dinner, that she brought it up directly. She looked at me across the table and said, don't you think we've fallen into a rut? I could hear the frustration in her voice. We've been married for over 10 years, Michael. And sometimes it feels like we're just going through the motions I remember sitting there, stunned for a moment, trying to process what she was saying. To me, routine wasn't a problem. It was a sign of a solid marriage. But for Lisa, it seemed like something else entirely. I tried to understand her point of view, even though it wasn't easy. It felt like she was saying that our life together had become dull, that the same stability I cherished was now something she resented. It wasn't just about the day-to-day -day activities it seemed deeper than that. She talked about how we weren't as spontaneous anymore, how we didn't do the fun things we used to, how everything had become too predictable. For me, predictability was comfort. For her, it was suffocating. That conversation stuck with me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something bigger was at play, but at the time, I still believed it was something we could fix. I thought we just needed to try harder, to make more of an effort to break out of the routine she was so bothered by. What I didn't realize then was that this was only the beginning of something much more serious. At first, I thought Lisa's complaints were just about the everyday monotony of life. You know, the kind of boredom that comes when you're stuck in the same routine for too long. I figured that maybe she just needed a little excitement, something to break up the day-to-day -day grind. I didn't see it as a serious issue, more like a temporary phase. So I suggested we start doing new things, something to shake things up. I thought that if we could inject a bit of fun into our lives, it would solve whatever boredom she was feeling. We started small just trying out different activities together. Some of it was, honestly, pretty ridiculous. 
For example, one weekend, she got the idea that we should try a painting class. I had never picked up a paintbrush in my life, and here I was standing in front of a canvas, trying to follow the instructor's bizarre instructions to express my emotions with color. It felt absurd, but Lisa seemed to enjoy it, so I played along. My painting looked like a toddler scribble, but she laughed, and for a moment, I thought maybe this was the kind of thing we needed to do more of. Then there was the time we decided to try yoga. Now, I'm not exactly what you'd call a flexible guy, but she thought it might help us both relax and connect in a different way. We joined a class at some trendy studio downtown. It was one of the most awkward experiences of my life trying to twist my body into positions I didn't even know were possible, surrounded by people who made it look effortless. But again, I went along with it, figuring that if it made her happy, it was worth a try. I'm not going to lie, though it was one of those things that just wasn't for me. We also tried some more basic activities, like jogging together in the mornings. I've always been a bit of a fitness guy, so this one didn't bother me as much. We would run through the neighborhood, side by side, talking about anything that came to mind. It wasn't exactly thrilling, but it was something we could do together. I even suggested we start going on weekend hikes, exploring trails outside the city, hoping that a little time outdoors would reignite some spark between us. But no matter what we tried, whether it was something as absurd as painting or as simple as running, it never seemed to fully satisfy her. It was like she was looking for something more, something deeper, and I couldn't figure out what that was. We even tried salsa dancing one night. I've got two left feet, but I signed us up for a class because I knew she liked dancing. We fumbled our way through it, and even though we had a few laughs, I could still sense that underneath it all, something was missing for her. I kept thinking, isn't this what people do when they're trying to keep the spark alive we were trying new things, spending time together, breaking out of the routine she said she hated. But despite my efforts, it never seemed to be enough. No matter how much I tried to make things more exciting, Lisa still seemed unsatisfied. It became clear that the problem wasn't just the activities themselves. There was something more going on, something I couldn't fix with a few new hobbies. I just didn't know it yet. For a short while, it seemed like all those new activities were helping. Lisa stopped complaining about the monotony of our life, and I thought we were back on track. But as it turned out, the problem went deeper than just the everyday routine. One night, after another attempt at spicing things up with some new hobby, she brought up a different kind of boredom one that hit a lot closer to home. It wasn't just life that felt stale to her, it was our time in the bedroom. I have to admit, that caught me off guard. I've always prided myself on being a good husband in every sense. I wasn't just a provider, I was present, attentive and I thought our physical relationship was solid. So when Lisa casually suggested that maybe we should start trying out some toys or other things to make things more exciting in the bedroom, it felt like a punch to the gut. My first reaction was pretty blunt. I told her that if a man couldn't satisfy his wife on his own, then what kind of man was he? I had always believed that a husband should be able to handle that without the need for anything extra. I'm not one for gimmicks or novelties. My father, a man of strong values and old school beliefs, raised me with the idea that a man's role was clear you take care of your family and you handle things yourself, including your marriage. There was a certain pride in that. It's how I'd lived my life and it's how I approached my relationship with Lisa. I'd always been able to satisfy her in the past, or at least I thought I had. So the idea of introducing something else into our intimate life felt to me, like admitting defeat, like I wasn't enough on my own. I made my stance clear. I wasn't interested in turning our bedroom into some kind of circus. To me, intimacy was about the connection between two people, not about flashy gadgets or outside distractions. Lisa tried to explain that it wasn't about me not being enough, but rather about exploring new things together, as if that would make it better. But it still didn't sit right with me. I wasn't going to let our marriage become something I didn't recognize just because she was feeling bored. Still, I didn't want to completely shut her down. I understood that she was trying to express a need, and as uncomfortable as it made me, I wasn't about to ignore that. So, reluctantly, 
I agreed to try a few things. But I made it clear that there were limits. We tried a couple of minor things, nothing too outrageous, just small compromises to show I was willing to meet her halfway. But deep down, it still felt wrong to me. I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't the solution to our problems, and it definitely wasn't what I wanted for us. In my mind, it all came down to the values I had grown up with. I wasn't a man who needed external help to keep my wife happy. I believed that a strong relationship was built on a natural connection, without all the extra distractions. Maybe that made me seem rigid, but that's who I was, and I wasn't about to change that easily. I thought Lisa understood this about me from the start. After all, I hadn't changed I was the same man I'd always been, one who believed in a straightforward, traditional marriage. But clearly, something was shifting on her end, and it made me wonder if I had missed something along the way. Even though I tried to compromise a little, I still felt this growing gap between us. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that this wasn't just about boredom or trying new things. It was something deeper, something that went against the very foundation of who I was and how I saw our marriage. And that, more than anything, was what worried me. One evening, Lisa was getting ready for a night out with some friends. She told me she was going to take a shower and brought along a set of lingerie. I didn't think much of it at the time, maybe she just wanted to feel good about herself. She went into the bathroom, closed the door, and I could hear the usual sounds of her routine. Nothing out of the ordinary, just another evening at home while she prepared for her night. I was lounging on the couch, flipping through channels, not giving much thought to anything. A few minutes later, I heard her curse from the bathroom something like damn in frustration. She had forgotten her towel. I chuckled to myself, thinking, well, that happens to the best of us. She quickly darted out of the bathroom, wrapped in nothing but her lingerie, rushing to grab the towel from the hallway closet. It was all so normal, the kind of thing that happens in any household. I didn't pay much attention to it beyond that initial laugh. While she was busy searching for the towel, I figured I'd take the chance to use the bathroom myself before she settled in for her lengthy grooming session. I walked in casually, ready to take care of business. That's when I saw her phone on the counter, still unlocked. Now, I'm not the kind of man to snoop never have been, never wanted to be. But the screen was lit up, and right there in front of me was a video. A porn video. I noticed the title immediately it was a threesome. At first, I brushed it off. We all have our private moments, and watching that kind of stuff isn't exactly unusual. I'd seen my share over the years. But what made me pause was the specific nature of it this wasn't just your run-of-the-mill clip. It was about something very particular, something Lisa had never shown interest in before. A threesome. And that hit me harder than I expected. I stood there for a moment, staring at the phone, my mind racing with thoughts. Why that? Why now? I couldn't help but feel uneasy. Sure, everyone has their fantasies, but something about this felt off. I knew that she had been talking about boredom lately, but this. It was as if she was exploring something beyond what I was prepared for, and I didn't know what to make of it. I stood there, debating whether I should bring it up or just let it slide. After all, what's the big deal, right? People watch all kinds of stuff, but this felt different. It felt personal. In the end, I decided not to say anything. I put her phone back down on the counter and walked out of the bathroom trying to shake the unsettling feeling in my gut. I told myself it was probably nothing, just a random video she stumbled upon. But the truth is, it lingered in my mind. It didn't sit right with me, and I couldn't figure out why. Maybe it was because it wasn't just some random fantasy. It was the kind of thing that could have real consequences. Something was changing, and I could feel it, even if I wasn't ready to admit it yet. One evening, after a fairly typical day, Lisa and I were sitting on the couch, unwinding in front of the TV. The conversation was casual at first, but then out of nowhere, she turned to me and said, you know, my friend tried something the other day, she had a threesome. What do you think about that? Hypothetically, could we do something like that? Her tone was light, almost like she was just tossing the idea around, 
but the question hit me like a ton of bricks. I immediately felt a knot tighten in my stomach. I paused, taking a second to process what she was really asking. It wasn't just some random conversation anymore. It felt like the beginning of something more serious. I turned to her and said, what are you really asking, Lisa? What's going on here? If this is just hypothetical, fine, but if you're suggesting something, say it now I needed her to be direct with me because I could already feel where this was headed and I didn't like it one bit. She hesitated for a moment, but then came out with it. Well, yes, I've been thinking. What if we tried it, you and me and another man? You know, just to see if it adds some excitement. If it's not for you, you could even just watch. That was the moment I felt the ground shift beneath me. I stared at her in disbelief, trying to wrap my head around the fact that my wife, my wife of over 10 years, was asking me if I would be okay with her sleeping with another man. The idea that she would even consider this felt like a betrayal in itself. I didn't hesitate in my response. If you even think about doing something like that, Lisa, you'll be out of this house faster than the speed of light. Do you understand me? I could feel my blood boiling as I spoke. I had always tried my best to accommodate her, to make sure our marriage stayed interesting. But this? This was a line I would never cross. The very suggestion that she would want to bring another man into our marriage into our bed was something I couldn't tolerate. Not for a second. She tried to explain herself, saying she was just trying to find ways to keep things exciting that she was only suggesting it because she thought it might help. But to me, it felt like a violation of everything we had built together. I had been doing everything I could to support her, to make sure she didn't feel bored or neglected, but asking for something like this was beyond my limits. There are some things that can't be fixed with a quick thrill, and our marriage wasn't some playground for experimenting with other people. What followed was a heated argument. She was frustrated, accusing me of being too rigid and unwilling to even consider her feelings. I reminded her that I had tried, tried as hard as I could to bring new life into our relationship, but this, this wasn't about being open-minded. This was about destroying the very trust that held us together. I was angry, yes, but more than that, I was hurt. I had never imagined that Lisa would even think of something like this, let alone ask me to be okay with it. The argument didn't last long, but it left a heavy weight between us. I could tell she was upset that I had reacted so strongly, but I wasn't going to budge on this. There are certain principles I hold on to, and this was one of them. No matter how much I wanted to keep her happy, this was not an option. If she was really serious about it, then I wasn't sure if our marriage could survive much longer. After that argument, things seemed to calm down for a while. Lisa didn't bring up the idea of a threesome again, and to my relief, it felt like the tension between us had started to fade. In fact, things almost seemed better than before. She stopped complaining about boredom, and we got back into a comfortable routine. We weren't trying out new activities as much anymore, but it didn't seem to matter. Life felt normal again, and for the first time in a while I began to relax. I convinced myself that maybe she had just been going through a phase, and now that it had passed, we could focus on what really mattered our marriage. Lisa seemed happier too. She wasn't bringing up any complaints about our life or our relationship, and that in itself was a relief. The little cracks that had formed between us seemed to be mending, or at least I thought they were. We settled into a rhythm, one that felt familiar and comfortable. The arguments were fewer, the tension lighter. I even thought we were back to the way things had been years ago when everything between us felt easy. I thought maybe, just maybe, we had weathered the worst of it. It wasn't like everything was perfect, but in my mind we had reached a kind of balance. We didn't need to keep pushing boundaries or trying to reinvent ourselves. We could just be, and that was enough for me. Lisa seemed to be in a better mood most days, more energized, and even affectionate. There were no more awkward conversations or strange suggestions about our intimate life. She seemed to accept things as they were, and that helped me put the whole incident behind me. I began to trust that whatever had been bothering her was gone. But life has a way of throwing curveballs when you least expect them. Just as I was settling into this new sense of peace, I got hit with a bit of news at work. 
We had a major project coming up, one that was going to require a lot more time and effort than usual. My boss sat me down one afternoon and explained that for the next few months, I'd need to stay late an extra hour or so every day to meet the deadlines. It wasn't ideal, but I wasn't the type to complain. If the job needed to get done, I'd do it. It's what I'd always done. When I got home that evening, I told Lisa about the change in my schedule. I was expecting her to be a bit frustrated, knowing that I'd be coming home later for the foreseeable future. But instead, she seemed sympathetic, even concerned for me. That sounds exhausting, she said, genuinely. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. I don't want you burning out. It was a supportive reaction, more than I had anticipated, and it made me feel even more confident that things were going well between us. After that conversation, I settled into my new routine. I started staying late at the office, putting in the extra hours, but I wasn't too worried. Lisa seemed to be handling it well, and I thought everything was under control. Little did I know, things were starting to shift in ways I hadn't noticed. For now, though, I was focused on work and trusting that home was a stable place waiting for me when I got back. After I told Lisa about the long hours at work, I noticed something shift in her almost immediately. She seemed lighter, more energetic. It was subtle at first, but the more time passed, the more obvious it became. She was in a good mood all the time laughing more, smiling to herself around the house, and even humming while she did simple tasks like cooking or folding laundry. It was as if a weight had been lifted off her shoulders, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why. It wasn't that she had been unhappy before, but this change in her energy was something new. At first, I didn't question it. After all, things had been rough between us for a while, and now it seemed like we were in a good place. Maybe this was just her way of bouncing back. I was relieved, to be honest. She wasn't complaining about boredom anymore, and the tense conversations about our marriage had completely disappeared. It felt like things were finally falling into place. Every day when I came home from work, she was upbeat and engaged, asking me how my day was and genuinely interested in my answers. It was refreshing. But after a couple of weeks, her constant cheerfulness started to seem out of place. I'd come home exhausted from those long hours at the office, and there she was, full of energy and enthusiasm. She wasn't just in a good mood, she was almost euphoric, like she had discovered some new secret to life. I remember one evening, she was particularly animated, talking about how great everything was, and I couldn't hold back any longer. I asked her directly, Lisa, what's going on with you lately? You've been different. Happier, I guess. Not that I'm complaining, but what's changed? She paused for a moment, as if thinking over how to answer. Then, she smiled and said, Oh, it's nothing, really. I've just been watching some videos on YouTube, you know, about self-love and acceptance. I think it's been helping me a lot. She went on to explain that she had found this whole online community focused on personal growth, mindfulness, and the art of living a fulfilling life. According to her, the videos were all about appreciating the little things, making the most of every moment, and transforming life into something beautiful, something she called an aesthetic experience. I listened as she talked, trying to process what she was saying. It all sounded harmless enough, but the way she was describing it felt almost rehearsed, like she had been absorbing these ideas and adopting them as her own. You just have to learn to value your life for what it is she continued. I've realized that I wasn't truly appreciating everything I have. It's all about creating a sense of beauty in your life, in the everyday moments. Part of me wanted to be happy for her. If she had found something that made her feel good about herself, then that was a positive change, right? But something about the whole thing made me uneasy. It was almost too sudden, too drastic of a change, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was more going on beneath the surface. But I didn't press the issue. I told myself it was probably just a phase, that maybe these videos were giving her some kind of new perspective that she had been missing. In the days that followed, Lisa's newfound enthusiasm didn't waver. She kept talking about how important it was to make life beautiful and to curate your own experience. It was like she had found a new mantra. 
Every time I mentioned being tired from work, she'd encourage me to take a step back, breathe, and try to enjoy life more. While her words were kind, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. But for now, I let it go, hoping that her energy and positivity were just signs of her finding peace within herself. That day started out just like any other. I had been working long hours for weeks, so when my boss told me I could leave an hour early, I was more than ready to head home. It was a small break from the routine, and I figured I could surprise Lisa by being home earlier than usual. As I drove back, I thought maybe we could have a quiet evening together, or at least catch up on the day. There was no reason to think anything unusual was waiting for me. But when I pulled up to the house, something in the air felt off. I walked up the driveway, the front door unlocked as usual. Everything seemed normal at first until I opened the door. What I saw next is something I'll never forget, no matter how hard I try. As I stepped inside, I noticed the living room was eerily quiet. I didn't hear the usual sounds of the TV or any background noise, and I was about to call out for Lisa when I caught sight of the scene unfolding in front of me. There, in the middle of our living room, was Lisa. She was on all fours, completely naked, her body glistening with some kind of oil. A gag was strapped tightly in her mouth, and something some bizarre object was lodged in her rear. But that wasn't the worst part. Standing nearby were two men, both fully dressed but clearly involved in whatever was happening. My mind went blank for a moment, my stomach churning in disbelief. I couldn't process what I was seeing. This was my wife, in our home, in the most degrading position imaginable. Rage flooded through me almost instantly. Without thinking, I lunged for the fireplace, grabbing the poker from its stand. My body moved on instinct as I raised it in the air, ready to beat the living hell out of these men. My heart was pounding, my vision narrowing as I fixated on them. In the heat of the moment, I wasn't thinking about the consequences I just wanted them out of my house, out of my life. As soon as they saw me coming at them, the two men panicked. They threw up their hands, pleading for me to stop. One of them yelled, wait, wait, don't do anything, or leaving their faces were pale, and they clearly didn't want to stick around to find out what would happen next. In a rush, they bolted for the door, nearly tripping over each other in their desperation to escape. I stood there, clutching the poker, breathing heavily as they disappeared into the night. When they were gone, I turned to Lisa. She was still on the floor, still gagged, still covered in oil. I couldn't even look at her. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of the betrayal, the sheer insanity of what I had just witnessed. The anger inside me hadn't subsided, but now it was mixed with a kind of deep, guttural pain. This wasn't just about the act itself, it was about everything it represented. Everything I thought I knew about her, about us, had shattered in an instant. I dropped the poker to the floor and rushed over to Lisa, my mind still reeling from the shock of what I had just seen. What the hell is going on, I shouted, my voice echoing off the walls of our living room. I was furious, hurt, and confused all at once. She looked up at me, tears streaming down her face as she tried to pull herself together. The sight of her vulnerable and ashamed did little to quell the rage boiling inside me. I, I didn't know how to tell you she sobbed, her voice muffled by the gag in her mouth. I reached down and ripped it off, my hands shaking. I thought you'd never understand. You never supported my interests, my desires. I felt trapped. I couldn't live like this anymore. Her words cut through my anger, but the pain was still fresh, raw, and unyielding. I could hardly process her confession. How could she say this? Did she really think that seeking out other men was a solution to whatever was missing in our marriage? What do you mean you couldn't live like this? You had a life. We built a life together, I yelled back, my heart racing. I tried to do everything I could to make you happy. You think this is some kind of answer? I was desperate for answers, for any semblance of justification that would make sense of her actions. But all I saw was the betrayal written across her face. She looked down, ashamed, then finally met my gaze again. This marriage has felt like a book where every page is the same. I was bored, and I thought you didn't care. 
I didn't want to feel like I was just going through the motions anymore. I could hear the hurt in her voice, and it was painfully clear that she believed her actions were justified. I wanted to feel alive, to feel desired. I found those guys on Tinder. They gave me the attention I craved when you were busy working. A wave of disbelief washed over me. So you just decided to bring strangers into our home? Into our lives I spat, the hurt giving way to a deep sense of betrayal. You could have talked to me. You could have worked with me to find a solution. Instead, you turned to complete strangers. How could you think this was okay? The anger felt uncontrollable, and I struggled to keep my voice steady, fighting back tears of my own. I didn't think you would understand, she shouted back, her voice rising in desperation. You were so caught up in your work, in trying to provide. I felt invisible. I didn't want to feel like I was just someone's wife. I needed to feel special, and I thought I could find that elsewhere. It was all coming out now, the pain, the loneliness she had felt, the desperation that led her to those men. But I couldn't wrap my head around how she thought this was the answer. I backed away, trying to process everything. This wasn't just a moment of indiscretion, this was a fundamental breakdown of everything we had built together. I felt like I was standing on the edge of a cliff, staring down into the abyss, and all I could do was question whether we could ever come back from this. I knew then that our marriage had been hanging by a thread for some time, but I never imagined it would unravel like this. The reality of the situation settled in, and with it came an overwhelming wave of clarity mixed with resolve. I couldn't believe what had just happened, nor could I comprehend how Lisa had come to this point. My heart was still pounding in my chest, and my mind was racing with emotions I had never felt before betrayal, anger, and an aching sadness. As I looked around the living room, the remnants of our life together felt suffocating. I needed space, a way to reclaim my sense of self. Enough is enough, I finally said, my voice steadier than I felt. I marched toward the bedroom, where Lisa's things were scattered about. I felt a surge of determination as I started gathering her clothes, her belongings, anything that reminded me of the life we had built together. I was furious, but deep down, I knew I needed to take control of the situation. I couldn't allow myself to be trapped in this painful cycle of betrayal and heartache any longer. I threw her things into a pile near the front door, my hands shaking as I did. Each item felt like a weight lifting off my shoulders, but at the same time, the reality of what I was doing hit me like a ton of bricks. I had never imagined that it would come to this throwing my wife out of our home, forcing her to face the consequences of her actions. It felt surreal, like I was trapped in a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. Get your things and leave, I said, trying to keep my voice steady despite the chaos swirling within me. I can't do this anymore. You need to go the finality of my words hung in the air thick with tension. I watched as her expression shifted from shock to desperation. She opened her mouth to protest, to plead, but I couldn't bear to hear it. The betrayal was too fresh, too raw, and I was done listening to excuses. She stood there, naked and vulnerable, a picture of what our life had become. I felt a pang of sympathy, but it quickly dissipated as the reality of the situation set in again. You brought this on yourself, Lisa, I said, my voice firm. You made your choices, and now you have to deal with the consequences. You can't just expect to come back from this. I didn't want to be cruel, but I couldn't allow her to manipulate me any longer. As she gathered her belongings, the silence between us was deafening. It was a painful reminder of everything that had been lost, the trust, the love, the life we had shared. I felt like I was watching our marriage crumble in real time, and with every item she picked up, I felt a part of myself slipping away as well. The weight of what we had become felt unbearable, and I knew deep down that there was no turning back. Finally, when she had packed the last of her things, I pointed toward the door. You need to leave, and I want a divorce, I stated flatly, my heart heavy. She looked at me, her eyes pleading, but I stood firm. I couldn't be swayed. This wasn't just about her actions, it was about my dignity and self-respect. As she stepped out of the house, I closed the door behind her, 
feeling a mix of relief and heartbreak wash over me. I knew this was the right decision, but the pain of what had just happened felt insurmountable. After Lisa left, I thought the hardest part was behind me. I was filled with a sense of relief, believing I could finally start to rebuild my life. But that relief was short-lived. Within a few days, I received a notification that she had hired an attorney and filed for divorce. It was a shock to my system, especially given the circumstances surrounding our separation. I had expected a messy breakup, but this felt like a calculated move on her part, and it made my blood boil. Things quickly escalated. Lisa didn't just want the divorce she wanted to complicate the process. She started dragging her feet on the paperwork and would come up with all sorts of excuses to delay everything. Each day felt like a new surprise, and I was constantly left in limbo, unsure of what was going to happen next. It was exhausting and mentally draining. I found myself staring at the walls of my house, reliving the betrayal over and over, while trying to make sense of this new, twisted reality. At one point, I considered settling just to get it over with. I wanted to close that chapter of my life and move forward, but something inside me said that giving in wouldn't resolve anything. I needed to stand my ground, even if it meant facing her tactics head on. I confided in a close friend about what was happening, and he listened patiently, understanding the turmoil I was going through. After hearing my story, he said, you need a good lawyer, someone who can handle this situation. Trust me, it will make all the difference. Taking his advice, I began my search for an attorney. After several interviews, I found a lawyer who specialized in family law and had an impressive track record. They were straightforward with me and explained the intricacies of the divorce process, making it clear that we had a solid case. I felt a renewed sense of hope as we discussed the next steps. Finally, I was in a position to fight back, to reclaim my life from the chaos Lisa had unleashed. As the divorce proceedings progressed, Lisa's initial bravado began to falter. She realized that I wasn't backing down. The more my lawyer pushed back against her tactics, the more Lisa seemed to retreat. There were moments during mediation where she tried to negotiate terms that favored her, but my attorney was sharp and well-prepared. They didn't let her manipulate the situation they called out every attempt at delay and brought forth the truth of what had transpired. Eventually, the court date arrived, and I walked into the courtroom with a mix of determination and anxiety. The atmosphere was tense, but I felt supported by my attorney, who had done an incredible job preparing me for this moment. The judge listened to both sides, and after what felt like an eternity, they ruled in my favor. It was a huge relief. The divorce was granted, and I finally felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. As I walked out of the courtroom, I felt a sense of freedom I hadn't experienced in a long time. I had faced the worst part of my life, and now I was ready to move forward. The divorce was finalized, and though it had taken longer than I anticipated, I was proud of myself for standing my ground. I knew I could finally begin to heal and focus on rebuilding my life, free from the shadow of the past. After the divorce was finalized, life took on a new rhythm for me. At first, I felt a sense of emptiness, like I was walking through a fog. I had been so consumed by the turmoil of my marriage and the subsequent legal battles that I hadn't fully grasped the weight of what had happened. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to find solace in my newfound freedom. I spent time reflecting on my past, processing the pain, and slowly rediscovering who I was without Lisa by my side. I threw myself into my work, immersing myself in projects that I had previously put on the back burner. The focus was invigorating, and I found a sense of purpose in what I did. It felt good to be productive again, to channel my energy into something constructive rather than dwelling on the heartbreak. I also began to reconnect with friends, going out, and exploring hobbies that I had neglected. Each small step felt like a victory, a reclaiming of my life that had once felt so constrained. Meanwhile, Lisa was navigating her own post-divorce journey. I heard from mutual friends that she was struggling, trying to adapt to life without me. She had moved into a small apartment, 
and the freedom she had once sought seemed to come with its own set of challenges. From what I gathered, she was trying to fill the void with new relationships, but they lacked the depth and connection we had once shared. It was as if she was searching for something to fill the emptiness left by our marriage, but nothing seemed to work. A few months later, I received an unexpected phone call from her. It caught me off guard I hadn't heard from her since the divorce was finalized. Her voice trembled on the other end of the line. Can we talk? She asked, the sincerity in her tone catching my attention. I agreed to meet, mostly out of curiosity and a desire for closure. When we met, I could see the toll that the past few months had taken on her. She looked different, more fragile, yet also more resolute. As we spoke, Lisa admitted how much she regretted her decisions. She expressed her longing to reconcile, to try again, insisting that she had learned from her mistakes. It was a heartfelt plea, one that stirred up a mix of emotions in me. But as I listened to her, I realized that while she had changed, I had also transformed in my own way. I was no longer the man who would settle for half measures or ignore red flags. Lisa, I said gently, but firmly, I've moved on. I can't go back to the way things were. I've spent too long rebuilding myself, and I can't risk falling back into the same patterns. I wish you the best, but I can't be part of your life again. Her expression fell, and I could see the hurt in her eyes, but I knew it was the right decision. In the months that followed, life continued to evolve. I embraced the challenges and opportunities that came my way. I learned to appreciate my solitude, realizing that I was stronger and more resilient than I had ever given myself credit for. I began to understand the importance of boundaries and self-respect. The experience taught me that sometimes moving forward means letting go of what once was, no matter how painful it might be. As for Lisa, I hoped she would find the clarity she needed to heal. We were both on different paths now, and while I would always hold some memories of our time together, I was determined to forge a future that was uniquely mine. The moral of my story? Sometimes the hardest decisions lead to the most profound growth. Life may throw us into chaos, but it's up to us to navigate through it, emerging stronger and wiser on the other side.